God has put a burden on his heart to minister and come and uh, yeah. reach out to our hurting nation. And I thank God for that. He's an answer to prayer. Let's give him a warm welcome. I love what you shared about when you came to Christ. You said things were greener, brighter, and that was my experience. I was an atheist that came to Christ. And I remember I was in a Denny's restaurant, and a gentleman sat down with me, and he shared the gospel with me after I said I need to know something about God. I have been studying and trying to learn about who God is, and I was an atheist to believe in God, but then I had a car wreck and started having a desire. Uh, to find out about Jesus. And what happened is he told me, right here in this restaurant, you're going to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I thought, no way am I going to sit in this restaurant and do some kind of prayer thing. And he says, well, you can do it outside and out in the woods. I lived in southern Oregon. And it looks like this. A lot of this area looks like it. I thought, that's a good idea because I'm not going to do it in a restaurant where people are. Well, I'm a little bit weird. You're going to find this out. I'm a little bit strange because I go to go into the bathroom stall to go to the bathroom. And very clearly there was a, a, in my mind was, why don't you accept Jesus Christ right now? So I didn't accept him in a field. I set, accepted him in a bathroom stall. Do you know that's okay with Jesus? <laughs> and when I walked out and I drove, everything looked like it came to life. It's hard to, if you haven't had that experience, it's like everything came to life. It was like, wow, life is real. And I remember going home and he said, give me a call when you, when you uh, accepted Christ. And I called him up and I was excited to be to tell him about Jesus. Well, my name is Richard Dover. And my wife is Carmelita. Should I sing your song? No, I won't sing her song. I have a song for my wife, but I won't sing it today since I can't sing but my wife is Carmelita. We've been married for 19 years. Uh, the next uh, uh, year, uh, it'll be 20 years. We've had a perfect marriage. Never had any problems in our marriage whatsoever. Okay. We've had struggles in our marriage. And I might even share some of those when we go through some of this. But uh, we have a heart for ministry. The way we've gotten uh, to know each other is because of ministry. And when we came here back in the end of June, the beginning of July, we came with the youth camp here, and we just saw a hopelessness that was around here. There was a lot of hopelessness in this area. And we believe there is hope through Jesus Christ. Amen. We believe there's hope through Jesus Christ. And so we said, maybe some point we'll come to do what we can to share the, the hope of the gospel to individuals. We also saw that there's a lot of brokenness. And that's why there's hopelessness when there's brokenness. And so uh, we really just prayed and said, God, what do you want us to do? As soon as we walked out the door, Debbie asked when we was going to come back. And we had a plan if he was coming back or not. And then God confirmed for that to happen. And I'm going to be honest with you. We'll be back again. Amen. Praise the Lord. We will be back again. Because the gospel is the answer. Amen. But not as the gospel the answer. Spiritual warfare is the answer. Do you know there's a spiritual battle going on in this community? In every community in America, there's a battle going on. But in this community, there's a battle that's going on. And I believe the only way it's going to be broken is through spiritual warfare. And so I believe we're supposed to come back, teach some classes on that. Maybe we'll get a chance to do that while we're still here. We're going to be here a couple of weeks. But what I want to share with you today is the transforming power of of the love of Christ, the transforming power of the love of Christ. Lord, I pray that the words I speak won't just be words, but it'll be your word and that it pierces into the heart of each one here. That, Lord, each of us need to have a greater understanding of the love of Christ, but some here have no concept how much Jesus loves them, how much he cares for them, how much he wants them to walk in victory, over every sin in their life, how much he wants to use them for his kingdom, how much he has called them to be ambassadors for Christ. So I pray that uh, today, this morning, Lord God, we will grab hold of the concept of the love of Christ that transforms. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> if you want to grab your Bible, you can. We've got the verses up here. If you want to look it up, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to stay in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
I believe 2 Corinthians chapter 5 has principles that if we gain and understand those principles, it can transform our life. It can make us different people. And we may already know Christ, we may be already be serving Christ, we may be honoring Christ. But how many know that we need to grow? Amen. That we need sanctification on a daily basis. And so God wants to set us apart. He wants to keep doing something in our life to make us more of a reflection of Christ. We're going to find out why in a moment here. But if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, there's a powerful verse that is there. It's verse 14 and verse 15. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 says, For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. All were dead, and what that means, we're all dead in our sins. So it says the love of Christ constrains us. And that word constrains means to compel, to drive to urge, to, to grab hold of. So it says the love of Christ grabs hold of us. And if it truly has grabbed hold of us, the love of Christ has truly grabbed hold of us, 2 Corinthians 5.15 says what will take place next. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but to him which died for them and rose again. So if the love of Christ has constrained us, if the love of Christ has grabbed hold of us, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is we're going to start to die to self and live for Him. Does that make sense? If, if I really love my life, my, my life, if I really love my wife, what will happen? Will I have to make her do things for me? Or will she just want to honor me as her husband? If she loves me, am I not going to want to do things to please her? Just in the natural realm, how much more when it comes to the love of God? If we truly grasp hold of the love of God, and it has grabbed hold of our hearts, has grabbed hold of our lives, there is something in us that wants to honor Him. There's something in us that wants to live for Him. And I would say the more we understand the love of Christ, the more we want to give. The more we understand what God has done for us, the more that we want to do something for Him. And I would say that for some, the struggle is is they may have said some words like, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you as my Savior, but that's all it was. And because they said those words and that's all it was, there's not a transformation that's taking place in their life. But when we truly have come to a place where we really have received Christ into our life, the Holy Spirit is going to put something in us and we're going to appreciate what He's done for us. And I can say for me as, a, as an atheist that didn't believe in God whatsoever, for, for several years until I was about 23 years old. I mocked Christians, I laughed at Christians, I thought they were the dumbest people in the world, and if you need Jesus as a crutch, go for it. I don't need a crutch. I'm strong enough myself. And I had that attitude, and I was a very self-centered individual. I was better than anybody else, at least in my mind, I was better than everybody else. Because I certainly wasn't like those drug addicts, you know those rotten, terrible drug addict people? I wasn't them. I just drove, dr drove and drank, or drank and drove. I just would drive so to, and get so drunk that I couldn't remember how to get home. But I wasn't those rotten, filthy drug addicts. Do you know that each of us have those kind of mindsets in different realms? We compare ourselves to who? Not to God and His holiness. We're caring to compare ourselves to somebody around us. Guess what? You can always find somebody worse than you. You always can. Can I remind you something? You always can find somebody better than you, too. But what happened, when I accepted Christ, all of a sudden, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't understand it. All of a sudden, I had this burden to touch people's lives somehow. I didn't even know what that meant. I did not live a life to, of, of touching people's lives. I lived a life to move up to the top. And all of a sudden, I had, and I didn't know what to do with it. But thankfully, I came into a little bitty small church in a small town. And I walked in that church and that pastor grabbed hold of me and mentored me. And loved on me. And when he loved on me, I experienced the love of God in a greater way. So within a few months, I was a youth leader. I don't think you should do that. A guy that's been an atheist and, and a couple months after Christ becomes a youth leader, I didn't even know anything about this Bible. But he saw that I had a heart to touch people's lives and he mentored me 
And what little bit I could do, I would do it all I could to, to minister to those young people, to help them to, to come to Christ, to help them to grow in Christ. I couldn't help but do that because I experienced the love of Christ within me. So again, the love of Christ will drive us, compel us, constrain us to serve God. And so what happens is when we accept the, uh, Christ into our life, you can go to the next slide. Are you already there? New creation in Christ. Here's what happens is when we end up receiving the love of Christ in our life, what do we do? We receive Jesus into our heart. We become what the Bible says, saved or born again. And then the Bible says we become a new creation in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We suddenly become different than who we were. Has anybody ever experienced that? That you, when you came to Christ, did something start to change in you? Now, it may sound as a dramatic change, an amazing change. For others, it may not be dramatic. But if you're truly born again, something starts to change in you. Maybe, I, I'll tell you this, my hardest struggle has been as a Christian than I ever was an atheist. You know why? When I was an atheist, I wasn't convicted about anything. I just did whatever I wanted to do. I become to Christ, and all of a sudden, I start to feel bad if I do something wrong. In fact, I actually know what is wrong. And so what happens, the Holy Spirit comes into our life, we become a new creation, there's a change that takes place, and the first thing that takes place is justification. We're made right with God. So all of a sudden, we have a connection with God that we did not have before we came to Christ. All of a sudden, we, our spirit man has come to life. And so we become a new creation, something starts to change in us. But not only that, there's a process called sanctification that takes place. And what happens is God doesn't leave us where we're at. Do you know that? When we accept Christ, He just doesn't leave us there. He has for us to grow. And so all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit convicts us. We suddenly realize that we need to repent. We ask God to forgive us. And then we find out areas of our life suddenly go away. And let me share something with you. If you've accepted Jesus and nothing has gone away, that should go away, are you born again? I'm not saying to be perfect, I'm not talking about being perfect, but if I accept Jesus to my life, something should start falling off. Does that make sense? If I'm a new creation, if I'm different, something needs to be falling off. And so what happens is God starts to sanctify us. He starts to set us free from the world. And so slowly but surely, what starts to happen? There's a transformation that's taking place. Why is it taking place? Because we experience the love of Christ. The love of Christ will start to change our heart, it will start to change our life, it will change our walk, it will change the way we think. So there's a process that goes on. And then the next thing is, is we get to the ministry of reconciliation. You can go to the next slide. God doesn't leave it. This is amazing. He takes us from the realm of sin and death and brings us into eternal life. He then starts working in our heart, working in our life. We become that new creation, but He doesn't leave us there. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.18, All things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So what does God do? He saves us, He starts to change us, and He calls us to share that hope that we have with others. I think it's amazing, I don't know, maybe some of you have arrived, okay, maybe you got there, okay, I, I don't know why you haven't died yet if you got there, but I think everybody here probably hasn't got there yet, but you know God wants to use you right where you're at, if you're born again, if you accepted Jesus into your life, he wants to use you to touch other people's lives, he wants to give you the ministry of reconciliation. You have the privilege, you have the opportunity to be able to share the love of Christ with somebody else. And by you sharing the love of Christ with somebody else, they can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now why does God do that? Can't He use the angels to share the message? He could. But He chooses to use us. You know why? Because we have a testimony. We have a story. If we came to Christ and He's changing us, then we have something that He's done in our life that somebody else needs. Did you hear me? That there's something in our lives that God has done and somebody needs the same thing done in their life. 
And so, if you are a person that has struggled with, I don't like to name sins because you know what? Somebody thinks you're picking them out and I won't cover all of them. So if I'm going to pick out a sin, I'm going to cover everybody's sin. And that's hard. Too many people in the room to be able to cover everybody's sin. So if I say some sin, I'm not picking on you. And if you have the sin, then you have to deal with it and you work through it. But say you have a sin, whatever the sin is. I'll pick one like, uh, how about pride? Because everybody talks about addictions, right? Everybody talks about addictions all the time. How about pride? So you have the sin of pride. So you think you're better than everybody. And you come to Christ and you still think you're better than everybody. But what does God do? He starts to humble you. He starts to change you. He starts to make it so that you no longer think you're better than others and you realize that you're no different than others. Amen. Then what happens is that God says, you know what? you got that friend and you know all that pride that friend has. I want to use you. So what happens is God starts to make you more humble and you have this heart of humbleness that friend looks and says, Rich, what happened to you? I mean, you used to really be a jerk. You used, well, I think you probably still say about that about me sometimes. You used to really be a jerk. And you seem to you just seem to be different. You seem to not be as prideful. You just seem like like you, you don't think you're any better than anybody else. What happened to you? What's the answer? The answer is Jesus. And then Italian says, you know what? Life is so much easier to not have to be better than everybody else. Life is so much easier just to live life and love on people. And the friend says, you know, I just try to be the best all the time. And it gets old. Well, guess what? I know somebody who is the best. Instead of you trying to be the best, I want to introduce you to somebody who is the best. So then what do you do? You being the, an agent of reconciliation. And so I want you to look at your life and say, if I've accepted Christ into my life and God is starting to change me, what am I doing to reconcile others to Christ? What am I doing to help somebody know Jesus Christ? What am I doing to help somebody know the love of God? What am I doing and you're going to sin again? So we are righteous in Christ. That means we can walk in righteousness. We can walk in holiness. We can walk in victory over sin. We can be an overcomer. We can be a, a Christian who has victory in their life. Can you walk in victory? If you're a Christian, can you walk in victory? As a Christian, can you say no to sin? You know what it should be? Absolutely you can say no to sin. Somebody told me, they said, you know what? You talk a lot about walking in holiness and purity and how we can have victory in Jesus. But, you know, we're going to get up and we're going to sin every single day. I says, well, I don't plan on getting up and sitting every single day. I plan on serving, God, plan on serving God. And when I do sin, what do I do? What do you do when you sin if you're a Christian? Repent. Ask God to forgive you. And you get back up and you start fresh. Right? You start fresh. That's all we can do is we start fresh. But too many end up believing the lie of the enemy that they're no good, they have no value, they have no worth, they have no significance. You're never going to get the victory. You're always going to be this. I said it, I said it in one of our meetings, I said, you know, the, the, the message is, if you're, if you're a native person, you're an alcoholic. That's what the world says. If you're a native, you can't help but be an alcoholic. It's in your genes. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I, 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 that's the devil himself. To say, because you're this or that, you have to be this or that. Not in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, you don't have to be an alcoholic, you don't have to be a drug addict, you don't have to be this, you don't have to be that. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so we walk in that newness of life. So, I want to go to the problem. I've already shared about the problem. I'm going to go to it, and then I'm going to kind of summarize here. So here's why then, if, 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 if God loves us, if we can walk in righteousness, if God is sanctifying us, why is it that we fall short? Why is it that there's backsliding that goes on? Why is it that there's those who claim the name of Jesus, but if somebody looks at them, they would never know they're a Christian? I hope that's not you. If it is, get it right today. Think about that. Do you want somebody to look at you and say, I don't know if you're a Christian or not, and yet you've accepted Christ? Get it right. Get that taken care of. So what's the problem? Part of it is we lack the lack of righteousness, the lack of walking in righteousness. Even though Christ has made us righteous, we don't walk in that righteousness. How do we walk in that righteousness? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
We allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life and change us. Another problem is why people backslide at times is because they're poor ambassadors of Christ. If, I, if I'm living a life that doesn't reflect the Christian life, after a while, I'm not going to be an ambassador of Christ. I'm going to hide. And when you stop sharing your faith, you stop talking about Jesus, when you stop sharing what God has done in your life, then the enemy takes you out all by yourself and you become all alone. So what happens, lack of righteousness, poor ambassadors for Christ, no desire to share the love of Christ. So what will cause you to backslide? When you no longer have a desire to share the love of Christ with anybody. You stay to yourself. I just got to take care of me. I barely can make it myself. How many times have I heard this? I, I can barely survive myself and you want me to help somebody else out? You know what I say? Help somebody else out and you'll start to survive. Touch somebody else's life and all of a sudden life is better. All of a sudden there's a change that takes place. If I'm, if I, I, I use exaggeration to prove points. If I'm spending eight hours a day doing pornography, I'm probably not going to share Christ to too many people. There's too much guilt. There's too much condemnation. So how do you get the victory over the pornography? One way is to go start sharing Christ and you won't have any time for doing your pornography. And then allow God to work in your heart. What is there that causes you to go to pornography? What that causes you to go to these? Let God to work in those things. Another thing that problem that happens is minimum evidence of being a new creation in Christ. So I'm going to say this. It's not very popular, but I'm going to say this. Some people are not born again that think they're born again. Can I say that? Some people are not born again even though they think they're born again. There's no fruit. There's no evidence that they've been born again. None. Zero. Nothing's changed. It's like I would I would walk the streets and I talk to guys and as I share with them and after a while everybody knows me. I know all of them and, and it would only be the new people that come along and they all introduce me as their pastor. But I talk to somebody and they say, oh, I love Jesus. I don't know if they love Jesus or not. They say they love Jesus. I say, uh, well, that's good that you love Jesus. But do you have relationship with Jesus? There's a difference. I can love my wife and not have a relationship with her. I can love her but never show up. Is that love? I don't think that's love. So a person says, well, I love Jesus. They says, well, have you received him into your life? Oh, yeah, I did that. I did that. I, I said a prayer. You ever heard that one? I said a prayer. Do you know saying a prayer doesn't mean you're born again? Do you know that? I'll tell you how a lot of guys in the streets said the prayer. You got that holy, righteous Christian that walks up to the guy that's the gutter drunk. They give him a Bible track and he says, here, read this. The guy reads it. And then he says, now you just say the prayer. Say the prayer at the end and then you'll be saved. So he gets the guy to say the prayer and then the, that righteous Christian walks away. Leaves that guy all alone. You know most of the time those guys are not saved. Why? Never said to him you need to repent of your sins. Never said that you're a sinner that needs a savior. Never shared with him that, hey, you know what? That when Jesus grabs hold of your life, he'll transform your life. And you know what? God can deliver you from this God. They get him to say a prayer. Saying a prayer doesn't save you. Repentance and turn to God is what saves you. So the problem is a lot of reason that people backslide because they never were saved in the first place. They never backslid. They were never born again in the first place. You don't backslide from something you've never been. And so the question is why? Why? What's happened to this individual that they're at that place? They haven't encountered the love of Christ. They haven't experienced the love of Jesus. And so how do you do that? How do you experience the love of Christ? Let's go to the next slide, the love of Christ. Let's go back to where the Word says. The Word says the love of Christ constrains us because we thus, thus judge that if one died for all, that we're all dead, dead in our sins. Here's the truth. All of us are sinners. All of us are sinners. Without Christ, we're going to hell. God loves us so much, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. And so we can have forgiveness through Jesus Christ. But there isn't forgiveness unless I repent. Unless I confess my sins. And so what we do is we confess our sins to God and we say, God, I don't want to live this life ever again. I need you to set me free. 
then God does something amazing. If you're sincere about that, He does something amazing. He transforms your heart. I don't understand how it works. I don't understand at all. I don't know how a guy can walk into a bathroom stall and say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I'm a sinner because the Bible says I'm a sinner. I don't know if I am or not, but the Bible says it. I'm, I'm asking you to reveal to me if I am a sinner. And I turn around and say, Jesus, take hold of my life. I'm told that you need to be the Lord of my life, be the Lord of my life. And I walk out of that bathroom. Nothing happened, but I walk out of that bathroom, hop in, hop in my car, and boom. Life is different. I don't know how that works. Anybody have the answer how that all works? I don't know how that works. There's no formula to it. All I know is that when you do it and you're sincere, God does something amazing. As long as you're sincere, He does something amazing. And so what we need is to encounter the love of Christ. And then going back again is the love of Christ. If we truly have it, there's something in us that wants to start living differently. So if you have had an encounter with God and you have a desire to live differently and you're doing what you can to live differently, as much as you fall, much as you stumble, you're born again. God has entered into your life and He's bringing a change in your life. And so you may stumble, you may fall, and then the key is is that you just have to learn how to grow in that relationship with Jesus. And as you grow in that relationship with Christ, He does something in you. And He turns around and brings you to a place that He just starts changing your heart. You start falling more in love with Him. And all of a sudden, you just want to be different. And the more you're around Him in His presence, there's more that you want to grow and change. And after a while, things just start falling off. Anybody have anything that's fallen off of you that you don't do that you used to do? Anybody have things that you used to do you don't do anymore? Anybody have things that used to bind you up but they don't bind you up anymore? It's because of the love of Christ. He's changed you. He's transformed you. And He wants to continue to change us and transform us. So the question I have for you, are you transformed? Are you transformed? Has God done something in your life? Can you say beyond a shadow of a doubt, I have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ? If you've been transformed by God, then He will continue to do a good work in you. And what your job is, is to continue just to be in relationship with Him, grab hold of Him, and be obedient. You can have a relationship with Him, but not be obedient. How many know that? Do you know you can, you can totally disobey God and He still loves you? Did you know that? That you actually, God can say to you, you know, everybody says, I don't want to accept Jesus because he'll call me to be a missionary to Uganda. Maybe he'll call you to be a missionary here. But if I accept Christ and he calls me to be a missionary in Uganda, guess what he'll do? He'll equip me to be a missionary in Uganda. If he calls me to be a missionary in Uganda, he will put the love of Christ in me for the people that live in Uganda. And so out of it is we accept Jesus, He does the transforming work, and He starts to change us, and then what starts to happen is we just want to go along with whatever Christ has for us. Trust in Him. He'll take us there. So, the question is again, are you born again? Have you have, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you saved? Whatever word you want to use. And then the next question, this is the harder question, this is the tougher question. Are you born again and Jesus is your Savior but not your Lord? Do you know that's why a lot of people have problems in their walk with Christ? That's why a lot of people don't reflect a good, being a good ambassador of Christ? Because they have Jesus as their Savior to get them to heaven, but He's not the Lord of their life. What I mean? I'll talk about Jesus, I, I, I like Jesus, I love Jesus, I'll share about Jesus, but you know what? I'm still going to live my life. He's not going to tell me what to do. Then He's your Savior, not your Lord. And what happens is if Jesus isn't your Lord, who is? There's only two. Either you or the devil. If Jesus isn't the Lord of your life, it's either you ruling your life or the devil ruling your life. So if you're a Christian, you've been born again, and He's your Savior, and you're ruling your life, or he, the devil, becomes more the Lord of your life, you're going to have a poor witness. You're not going to be a person that reconciles others. You're going to be a person that's not a great ambassador to Christ. 
And I'm going to tell you something. I think the church, the body of Christ, has failed in this area. We make salvation, which is so simple. What we do is make salvation is just say a prayer, just accept Jesus, and then live however you want to live, and that's okay. Because that, you know what? That's not my business. So you just live wherever you want to live. If you have a brother or sister in the Lord, and you know they're not living right with God, what should you do if you love them? Should you reach out to them? Should you say, hey, brother, I'm here to help you. I know you're struggling with this area. Is there any way I can help you? I want to pray for you. I'll, I'll do whatever for you. I'm not going to say to them, oh, it's okay. It's okay. You're beating on your wife and you still love Jesus. It's okay. Why is it none of us would say it's okay to beat on your wife, but we would say it's okay to beat on ourselves? Why is that acceptable? Not to beat on your wife, but you're beating on yourself and you're a believer in Christ. If you really know the love of Christ, you, you'll turn around and you'll get the help that you need to get the victory. Because what happens is when we get caught up with drugs is our Lord, gambling is our Lord, uh, uh, greed, I didn't touch that one. I came from Seattle. Seattle is a land of greed. You know in Seattle, people play, they pay, they'll pay $400 to watch a football team. $400 to watch a football team. And they'll walk by when we're doing a feeding program on a Saturday to feeding people. And it costs $100 to give them 100 people 100 burgers from Jack in the Box. And they'll walk by and they'll frown on those homeless people as they walked out of the ball game paying $400 to watch a, a football game. They haven't been transformed by the love of Jesus in a certain area of their life yet. And so, what if that's it? Maybe somebody here, maybe you spend $400 on football games. I hope you don't spend the dollars on football games. Whatever it is that is controlling your life, are you willing to let Jesus take control of that area of your life? Are you willing to let him be the Lord of that area of your life? So the question is, again, are you transformed? Is God transforming you? Is he changing you? Is he molding you? Is he shaping you? And are you cooperating? And I will tell you, if you're trying to live a righteous, holy life, you're trying to live a Christian life, and you're not born again, you're wasting your time, and it's very burdensome. Some people say Christianity is hard. Well, it certainly is hard when you're trying to be a Christian when you're not one. That's about the hardest thing you can possibly do, is try to, try to live like a Christian if you're not one. So as I close, ask yourself, am I born again? Only you will know that. Am I born again? Do I have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ? If not, you should come to the altar and say, Jesus, I, I want you in my life. I want to be born again. Some will never do that. You know why? Everybody around them thinks they're a Christian and they don't want anybody to know that they're not. That will take you to hell. Did you hear that? If you're worried about what other people think about yourself, if you don't have a safe relationship with Jesus, you don't have to come to this altar. You can do it from, from, from your seat. But if you don't have a safe relationship with Jesus, get that right right now. Don't worry about what other people think. Get that right. It's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of eternity in hell or eternity in heaven. But maybe you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but maybe as your Savior, but maybe you don't have him as Lord of your life. You've never let him take control of certain areas of your life. And you have your excuses, you have your reasons, you know, it's because of this, because of that. You know, I do this because of this, because of that. Get rid of the excuses. Get free. Be set free. You know, the reason I do whatever the, the controlling sin that's in your life, that, that sin that just seems to grab hold of you and won't let go of you, whatever that sin is, is what if you was to go to God? These are the reasons I do it. But I don't want any more excuses. I want you to set me free. I want you to deliver me. I want you to heal me of those things in my life that cause me to do what I do. Do you know that Jesus can heal you? Do you know that Jesus can heal you of every wound, every scar that's in your life? That you know that, that Jesus can heal you in such a way 
that you can stand up in front of people and you can tell them every dirty sin you've ever done and you really don't care what they think. Because your slave is clean with God, the God of heaven. The Bible says not to fear man, it says fear the one that determines your destiny. And so I can tell you, I've been divorced, I've been divorced more than once. My wife never likes me saying that, she never likes me saying it. But that's my story. I can't change my story. Can I change my story? I can't change my story. I've been divorced more than once. I've been suicidal. I have done things I, 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 I would not share in a group setting. But at the end of the day, there's nothing that you can know about my past that you can use against me because my past has been cleaned. Amen. It's wiped away. It's wiped away. Don't let that as an excuse. I, because I've done this, God will never love me. Because I've done this, I can never get freedom. It's a lie from the pit of hell. No matter what you've done, where you've been, it don't matter. I can tell you now, doing prison ministry for as many years as I did, there's not a single person here that's ever done some, something that I haven't heard about already. I mean, I've worked with people who've killed more than one person. I've worked with rapists. I've worked with, with individuals that are child molesters. I've worked with people who have uh, broken into homes that were on the news. And they said this guy was a burglar. This is what he did at every place he, he broke into houses. I met that guy. God loves him. If we repent, we repent. So I'm going to open up the altar. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a manipulating guy when it comes to altar calls and all that kind of stuff. It's not who I am. I kind of lay, lay back. But I'm going to say something. If there's something that's stopping you from serving Jesus all the way, you should run to this altar. If there's something that, that's interfering with your relationship of, with Christ, something that's interfering with your testimony for Jesus, you should run to this altar. Give it to God. I will tell you this. I believe God can work in the pews. I think He can work in your home. I think He can work in the grocery store. He can work in a bathroom stall. God can work anywhere. But guess what? A lot of reasons people don't come to the altar is because of, of embarrassment and shame. And the devil sits there and he looks at me and he says, I know that God's calling you. Because until you take that step, you're not going to get free. But the devil's going to tell you, it all happened there, so I have a question for you. Every one of us have heard altar calls in church, right? We've heard altar calls. Has anybody ever not responded to an altar call when God told them? You don't have to raise your hand. Has anybody, there's an altar call, you know it was for you and you didn't go. Because you said, it'll happen in the pew. I have a question for you. Did it happen? Did it happen? I would say most of the times it didn't happen. Maybe there's an altar call to take your drugs and bring them to the, pew, to, to the, to the altar. And he says, you know what, I don't want nobody to know I do drugs, so I'm not going to take them to the altar. I'll throw them in the bathroom when I walk out the door. Did you? Probably not. I remember a guy, smoker, heavy duty smoker. You know, one of the smokers where his fingers are all, you know, brown and everything else because he smokes and he's, you know, pick up every butt in the ground and all that. He was just absolutely addicted to cigarettes. And then he would tell me, well, you know, smoking cigarettes isn't a sin. Okay, smoking cigarettes isn't a sin, but the fact that you're picking them off off the ground and you're smoking everybody else's cigarettes is probably a sin. Okay? If you've got to do that, it's controlling you. It's a controlling spirit. And he turns around and he comes to the altar and he throws the cigarettes at the altar. He walks out the door and he walks up to one of the church members and he says, hey, do you have a cigarette? So I'm not telling you just to go up here to entertain me, make me feel good, to make somebody happy. I'm saying to come here for yourself, to let it go. So as I close in prayer, if you want to come up, get prayer. It might be prayer to receive Christ. It might be prayer to get delivered from something. Maybe you need some healing in your life. Maybe there's a, a, something that haunts you and you want to be free today. God can do that. So Lord, we come to you. I don't know how effective I was and really to share about your love and how it can transform us or not. All I can do is trust in your Holy Spirit that there's somebody here that maybe understands the love of Christ a little better, that Jesus loves them, he 
wants to see them set free to walk in victory. That Jesus wants them to, to be able to, to have such an encounter with him that it totally transforms their life. And I would pray, Father, if there's someone here that has something they need to leave at the altar, that they would come to this altar. That they would make the commitment to step out by faith one step at a time to come to this altar and to kneel at this altar and give it to you. That, Father God, that you would bring wholeness to their life. You bring freedom in their life they've never known. That, Lord, there would be something that takes place in them that when they walk out this door, they know their life is different. You're a God that can do that. And we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to transform and change lives. So, Lord, if there's anyone here that you've called, I pray that they'll be faithful and obedient to come to this altar. So the altar's open up. You come up, and as you come up, uh, would you be willing to just give it all? Anybody at all that says, i, I got to give it all. There's, there's something I'm holding on to or something that's holding to me. Would you be willing to give it all? come to this altar and give it to God. Would you take that step, God speaking to you, to take that step of faith, to, to get out, to get out of the pew and walk this way. And if for whatever reason you just can't do that, the enemy is stopping you from, from doing that. If you just, no matter what, can't do that, will you make a commitment get me with me and my wife and talk to us afterwards privately. You just can't do it just publicly. There's no way you can do that. But you, you, you know that you need to get help. You need to get set free. Then I would ask you to, to get with me or my wife and just share with us. Share what your struggle is. Share what your pain is. Share what your hurt is so that we can pray for you so that you can, you can be set free because God wants you to be set free. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father God, for the love of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you're a forgiving God. You're a merciful God. We thank you, Lord, there is no guilt and condemnation in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you're sanctifying us, you're transforming us, you're changing us. You're making us more like Jesus every day. We thank you, Lord, when we fall short, that you're there to pick us up there to pick us up, put your arms of love around us and carry us to another day. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you'll never give up on us. We may give up on you, but you'll never give up on us. And so I pray for each person here, Lord God, as we end, that they will just make a, a decision. I, I'm just going to try to grab hold of more of Jesus. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, Jesus, I'm okay. Love me. I haven't allowed you to love me like you want to. I'm just going to say, here I am, love me. And that they'll have a secret time with you today, Lord. They'll have a time where they can get away and experience your love in a greater way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.